actually, Ellen, I should have asked, am I, should I just start the seminar or will there be an introduction? I'll, I'll introduce you briefly. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. You, I think John probably told that to me, but I missed it. And I think, right. John... um, I think we can get started. Um, and I, I will just say a few words quickly um, before um, I had um, Ellen introduce you. So, hello everyone, um, welcome to Ethics Seminar Series. This is John, the Seminar Coordinator. Together with me is Ms. Kathy Medley, um, who is our communication specialist, um, and also our um, Ethics Director, um, Anne Williams, um, is joining us. Um, and today we are excited to have our speaker, Professor Susan Nozier, joining us from Georgia Tech. And um, just so you know, then the seminar is being recorded. And it, it will later be published on our YouTube channel. Please be free to ask questions. You can do so by raising your virtual hand and we will unmute you. You can also send us text message in the chat. Um, so let's first um, introduce the speaker and we are glad to have our director, um, Professor Ann Williams here. Um, we will let the, um, Alan to introduce the speaker. So Alan, please produce. Thank you so much, John. It's our great pleasure today to, to have Professor Susan Lozier here to give the seminar for AOSC. Dr. Lozier has had a long and distinguished career in phys physical oceanography. She has degrees in chemical engineering and a PhD in physical oceanography from the University of Washington. Following her PhD, she did a postdoc at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and then moved to Duke U University uh, to begin her career as a faculty member. She's been active and productive in both teaching and research. And in 2019, she moved to Georgia Tech as the Dean of the College of Sciences. We're very happy and pleased to have Dr. Lozier here today. And she's going to talk, us about, talk to us about new results and new questions concerning the merid meridional overturning in the North Atlantic. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Fisher. Thank you, Ellen. That word's always a tongue toaster, the meridional yes. overturning circulation. That's why people say MOC. Anyway, I'm um, very happy um, to be here. I'm delighted to have this opportunity. I just want to say John has been an excellent uh, organizer and host, and I've really appreciated his virtual hospitality. Um, in my title after the colon, it says new results and new questions. But first, I just want to go back over 200 years and give you just a little bit of a context for how long we have been interested in this overturning circulation. In 1800, Count Rumford stumbled upon a letter that a British sea captain, uh, Captain Henry Ellis, had written in 1751. And in that letter, this sea captain described a single profile of temperature that he took um, while transiting the tropical Atlantic or what they called the torrid zone in 1751. And from that single profile of temperature, no CTDs then, this was all thermometer, you know, in a, in a wooden bucket. What they found was that the waters were very warm at the surface, comparable to the atmospheric temperatures. And then they, the waters decreased rapidly um, until they reached a depth of about a thousand meters. And at that point, no matter how much further they went with that rope and bucket, they, could, they couldn't uh, get any waters that were any colder. And essentially in 1751, this sea captain wrote back to this letter that ended up in the Royal Society of London, described the ocean thermocline, the waters, um, decreased rapidly, you know, in their temperature. And then there was a large volume um, of water, cold water at depth um, that um, filled that, that, that deep water. When Count Rumford stumbled upon this letter, I don't know if he stumbled, when he came upon the letter, um, he was really puzzled by it because he couldn't figure out how he could account for the temperatures at depth in the tropics that were so much colder than the atmospheric temperature in the tropics ever became. That's the part I didn't tell you. The atmospheric temperature you know, was in the 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but the temperatures there at depth in the tropics were by the measuring of the bucket, 53 degrees Fahrenheit, though they surmised that they were much colder. In 1800, Count Rumford wrote, um, it appears to me to be extremely difficult, if not quite impossible, to account for this degree of cold at the bottom of the sea in the torrid zone. 
on any other supposition than that of cold currents from the poles. So Rumford further reasoned then that this cold current at depth must necessarily produce a current in the opposite direction at the surface. And so with just those two sentences and from a single measurement um, of single temperature profile taken in the tropical North Atlantic, Count Rumford described in 1800 what we essentially have been calling for decades now um, the ocean conveyor belt, which was actually pinned not until the, I think, the late eight, eight, uh, 1980s um, by Wally Broker. And in fact, even school children today know about this great ocean conveyor belt. Back in 1800, Rumford realized that this conveyor belt, this movement of the waters, would really have a profound influence on climate because essentially warm waters at surface would be taken poleward, cold waters at depth would be, would be um, returning um, equatorward. Now, that uh, Rumford just sort of conjectured that there would this be, be this overturning from that single measurement, you know, of temperature in the tropical North Atlantic. Another 100 years or 120 years went by where really a spatial context was given to those cold waters um, at depth. And that was provided by the German Atlantic Exp Expedition, which was done in uh, the late 1920s. And so what you're seeing here is a cross section along uh, 20 West from one of those expeditions. This is showing the salinity, uh, showing the salinity um, here. Let's see, hopefully you can see my, my cursor showing the salinity um, from the um, Antarctic regions all the way up uh, to the Arctic regions. And what was quite noticeable is that the, they noticed the strong intrusion of relatively salty waters that emanated uh, from the surface of the North Atlantic. And those overrode the fresher waters from the Antarctic. So starting in the 1920s, oceanographers started getting this view of the interleavings of these water masses that originated at different places um, in the globe. But of importance for this talk, is this large volume that you see of the deep water that emanates from high latitudes in the North Atlantic. What we have come to understand is that of these deep waters that fill the global ocean, about 90% of these waters folk or have their origin in the high latitudes of the North Atlantic and the Arctic Ocean. And so the focus of this talk, and in fact, many um, um, studies focus on the origin and the variability of these deep water masses because of their importance to the um, meridiana overturning circulation. Now, those cross sections and subsequently in the decades following those 1920s, many uh, countries were going and doing hydrographic uh, cross sections, giving us a three dimensional view of the temperature, salinity, and oxygen in the North Atlantic. Um, and that gave us a real spatial um, understanding of these water masses. But it wasn't really until the 1970s that we um, developed a temporal understanding of these water masses. And that really came about from this GeoSex program, which is the Geochemical Ocean Section Study, which um, was conducted in the 1970s. And this was to give a baseline of the geochemistry in the North Atlantic. Again, we're looking here at a cross section from the equator uh, to 70 degrees north and we're looking at um, the depth here we're looking at the contours um, here of tritium and what we see we i think everybody understands that tritium is a byproduct uh, from the nuclear bomb testing that was done by uh, the soviet union in the u.s in the 50s and 60s and of course getting in um, to the atmosphere means it's going to be taken up by the ocean and what was remarkable here in the 1970s then was to see this, the penetration um, of the tritium to depth in the North Atlantic. And so prior to this, um, prior to the uptake of the tritium that was released from the nuclear um, bomb testing, there were no appreciable quantities of tritium in the ocean. And so now we could see really the ocean conveyor belt or this overturning um, circulation in action because we see at high latitudes, we see um, the uh, measurable quantities of the tritium. And so what um, Rumford and what oceanographers began to understand is that at the high latitudes in the polar regions, this is true in the high latitudes in the Southern hemisphere as well, 
Um, during the winters, when the ocean releases a tremendous amount of heat to the atmosphere, large volumes um, of deep waters are formed. So as those surface waters become denser than the waters under them, they become unstable, convectively unstable, they mix to great depths. And then when those, uh, those waters then, um, those large volumes of waters are then spread to distant parts um, of the global ocean. And interestingly, because of the temperature of salinity, in this case, tritium, uh, what in, because of the properties they have at the surface um, and low relatively mixing um, at depth, we can trace many of these um, water masses as they spread uh, from, from their source regions. So in the 1920s, we started being able to track uh, these water masses based on their hydrographic properties. But in the 1970s, we started getting a much better idea because of these transient tracers, much better idea of the time scales um, of these tracers and how important the um, overturning circulation was to the uptake um, of these tracers. So here in the um, in 1972, the tritium um, at depth, you know, it um, had penetrated to at least 40 degrees north. Now, moving forward um, into the late 1990s and 2000s, um, we have an even greater reason to understand um, the overturning circulation. So, as I mentioned, Rumford understood the importance of the overturning circulation uh, to the climate because of how it would impact the movement of heat. Um, as the ocean acts in partnership with the ocean, always trying to reduce that differential heating um, of the earth and that global uh, overturning circulation is the um, ocean's contribution. But here it became very evident um, from a series of cruises and measurements taken, taken in the late 1990s and the early uh, 2000s that the overturning circulation was not just taking on oxygen and tritium and the heat and the salt, um, but it was also really um, largely responsible for the huge uptake of anthropogenic CO2 in uh, the North Atlantic. And what we're looking at here is from the science um, article of Sabine et al. in 2004 that showed really that very um, strong column inventory of anthropogenic CO2 in uh, the North Atlantic. So we've had reason for many years uh, to study the overturning of circulation, but as of late, um, we have an even um, more imperative reason um, because we want to understand the extent to which the ocean has been um, an anthropogenic carbon reservoir and the extent to which it'll be an anthropogenic carbon um, reservoir in the years ahead. Now, if you had asked me or anyone maybe 20 or 25 years ago, um, how will the overturning circulation respond in the years ahead and will it continue to be this anthropogenic CO2 reservoir? I think most of us would have thought that answer um, was fairly simple um, because 20, 25 years ago, we, we were borrowing a paradigm from paleoceanographers about how um, the overturning circulation uh, worked. And it wasn't really until the late 1990s that physical oceanographers started paying more attention um, to, um, to the overturning circulation. And that really happened around the turn of the century. And I'm showing here the cut cover of this um, study that was put out by the National Re Research Council um, that was put out in, in 2002. And what um, there are a number of studies in there but the main takeaway was that an analysis of um, ice cores from both Antarctica and Greenland ice sheet showed that there were synchronous changes in the global um, air temperatures and that those synchronous changes um, happened on the time scales, you can read it here, in as little as a decade or less. And the mechanism that was hypothesized as responsible uh, for those changes was um, well, what was called then uh, the conveyor belt, essentially the overturning circulation. So for those of you that were in the field at the time, you'll remember um, 
there was a buzz on both sides of the Atlantic about the possibility of abrupt climate change. And suddenly, um, the study of the uh, conveyor belt that had really been in the purview of paleoceanographers really caught the attention of physical oceanographers because if these changes were possible in as little as a decade or less, certainly that is the realm for modern day physical oceanographers. So starting around the turn of this century on both sides of the Atlantic uh, in the US and in Europe, there really has been a concentrated effort both in the observational domain and also in the modeling domain to understand how um, the overturning circulation um, is structured and its possibility for change in the, in the decades ahead. Now, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, we had some assumptions about this um, overturning circulation. One assumption we had was that the overturning circulation varied um, on time scales, really uh, centuries or millennia. We didn't have an expectation that it varied on much shorter uh, time scales. We um, had an expectation that the lower limb, those deep waters um, of the overturning circulation really were carried along deep western boundary currents. I'll get to that in a moment. We had an expectation that the temporal variability in the overturning circulation was coherent from one latitude to the next. So if you think about the imagery of a conveyor belt, if we measured at one place, the expectation would be that the variability would be the same at another latitude. Another assumption we had was that the transport and property variability of this overturning circulation um, really resulted from changes in the formation of these deep water masses um, at the North Atlantic. So what I wanna do is um, in this talk, there's uh, three parts. I'm first going to talk about the revised geometry of the um, overturning circulation, the lower limb for this talk. I'm then going to talk about how new observations have given us insight into how the AMOC varies on interannual decadal time scales, talk about its linkage to deep water formation, and then I'll finish with some open questions. One more word before, before I get started on this part one. Um, the acronym AMOC, Atlantic Meridiana Overturning Circulation, really started being used um, in the around the turn of the century around as well, this turn of the century from the 20th to the 21st. The conveyor belt itself really had no mathematical um, construct and um, we was not that useful for the quantification of it, whether from observations um, or for um, modeling studies. Um, also, the conveyor belt um, almost then was used synonymously with thermohaline circulation. Um, but it's something we understand now that AMAP variability can come about from wind forcing. So uh, today, physical oceanographers refer to this, the AMOC, the Meridiano Overturning Circulation, which has a mathematical definition. It's basically the zonally, the net zonally integrated uh, northward flow um, at a particular latitude. All right, so let me get going with, um, with part one here. So based on theories, a theory, set of theories actually, um, in um, the 1950s, this um, are, that set of theories produced what I would call is the cornerstone of the paradigm that the deep waters spread from high latitudes to lower latitudes via um, deep western boundary currents. So. Um, this was based on a theory of large scale potential vorticity, a steady large scale potential vorticity dynamics that assume there was uniform um, upwelling. And the result of this theory was that if you needed to move these deep waters from high latitudes to low latitudes, they would go along the deep western boundary currents because everywhere else in the interior, the dynamics stipulated that there was poleward um, interior flow. And so for decades following the 1950s, oceanographers went out to the Western Boundary Currents. And indeed, they measured uh, signatures of these deep waters in the, in, the, in the North Atlantic that were moving from the high latitudes uh, to low latitudes. However, um, 
there has been definitely a change in our understanding of the geometry of these water masses. And so what I'm showing you in this schematic is the uh, ribbon diagrams that we have used for decades to describe the movement of the overturning circulation. And I'm going to draw your attention um, to the ribbons um, that are um, in the cool shades and the blue shades because this red to orange is the um, upper limb showing the waters from the extended Gulf Stream coming up, um, moving into the subpolar North Atlantic and then on into the Norwegian Greenland Seas. Um, the waters uh, coming um, across um, the Greenland Scotland Ridge um, on the eastern um, side here, these Iceland Scotland overflow waters were assumed to come down, crossing the Faroe Channel, uh, come along the western boundary, the Reykjanes Ridge, go up following the boundary current of the Erminger Sea through the Labrador and, and exported. And the same with the Denmark Strait wa overflow waters. So the deepest waters that fill the North Atlantic are those that originate from the Norwegian Greenland Sea, Denmark Strait overflow water, and Iceland Scotland overflow water. Added to that, uh, for years, we assume the other half of the waters in the lower limb were produced in the Labrador Sea. The Labrador Sea waters and the overflow waters were then assumed to export to the subtropical basin on to the equatorial region via deep western boundary currents. So I'm first going to talk about what we first investigated with an observational program, and that is the pathways of the Labrador Sea. And then I will talk to you about um, the overflow waters. So I'm hoping this is review for many of you um, on this talk uh, because this work has now been out for about 11 years. Uh, Amy Bauer, a colleague of mine at Woods Hole, were funded by um, NSF to test whether or not the waters, uh, the Labrador Sea waters, so those are the deep waters that constitute the upper portion of the uh, lower limb of the AMOC to test whether or not they stayed in uh, along the deep western boundary current. So uh, for three years, uh, we four times a year for three years, we put in floats within the Labrador Sea water in the deep western boundary current, tracked them downstream with sound sources distributed throughout the basin and tracked them for, for two years. And what you see is from the paper we published in 2009, which essentially shows that very, very few of these floats um, actually transit along the deep western boundary. In fact, most of that Labrador Sea water recirculated back into the subpolar gyre, but the water that did make it to the subtropics did so by interior paths. We were able to um, accompany that observational view with a view of the um, long-term spreading of both Labrador seawater on your left and the overflow waters on your right from this using uh, a numerical model, it's the high resolution eddy resolving um, ocean zone circulation model. And we're looking at the probability distribution that's constructed from 50 year trajectories from floats launched at those two black sites, which is where we launched the floats. And what you'll see is that particularly for the Labrador Sea waters, we don't have this um, western boundary um, constraint. Instead, we see the Labrador Sea waters move through uh, the interior of the basin on their way to the equator. The same thing uh, with, the, with the overflow waters. Now, what I want to do is tell you about our very new results that haven't been published yet from the um, OSNAP program, and I'll talk some more about that OSNAP program a little later. But here, what we did um, was go to these sites in the subpolar North Atlantic that are marked by black. And the reason we were interested in this is that the 1950s theory, the stommel ahrens theory that I talked about earlier, that theory was really for the abyssal water. These were for the waters where there was a source added to the open basin. And so it's not really applicable to the Labrador Sea waters, which are formed within the North Atlantic itself. It really, though, would be, pertain more to the overflow waters. Uh, these are the waters coming from the Nordic Sea, introduced to the North Atlantic over sills in that Greenland-Scotland Ridge. And so 
we wanted to test for the first time what the pathways were for those um, overflow waters. We're using the Rayflow's float uh, technology. And so we, over a period of two years, launched floats just downstream from where the Denmark Strait overflow waters into the North Atlantic, just downstream from where the Iceland Scotland overflow waters into the North Atlantic. And then we also introduced floats here on the western side of the Reykjanes Ridge, hoping to pick up that continuing flow of the ISOW. So this is the traditional view, these ribbons, you get a nice idea that the expectation is that these water masses are following the western boundary current of the um, western boundary current of the uh, of the subpolar North Atlantic. On your left is what we conventionally call our spaghetti diagram. So again, I'm showing you here these white dots are where the floats were actually released. The green um, are those floats that were released just downstream from the Iceland Scotland, um, or just in the Iceland Scotland overflow waters. Here again, we see the waters that were um, the floats that were released on the other side of the ridge, and these are the floats that were released. These dark blue that were released in the Denmark Strait overflow water. On the right, you can see these are the, gives you the background velocities and the dashed lines of the density surfaces and these triangles are the floats that we launched. Um, so you get it, you can see there sort of the details if you're interested in our deployment site. But overall, the view from that we get from this um, 135 trajectories is the view we got from our, in, in large part from our trajectories that we had released 10 years or so, now 14 years ago, in the um, Labrador seawater, that there is some movement in the Denmark Strait waters along the western boundary current, but we don't get that from the, from the Iceland Scotland overflow waters. Again, uh, looking now using a model as well, um, we can look at on the left panel, you see that black line tells us um, where the simulated trajectories have gone after 10 years of being launched from that site. And then on the right, you see a very different picture of those Iceland Scotland overflow waters in that the majority of those waters from our modeling study um, are moving down on the eastern side of that Mid-Atlantic Ridge, quite different from the Denmark Strait um, overflow waters. So all in all, the geometry that we have of this overturning circulation is far different than what was imagined, which is a good thing, that's how science works, what was imagined in the 1950s and 1960s with the boundary currents carrying really the bulk of these um, equatorward moving deep water masses. So we can safely say from these observations and our modeling results that the geometry of this overturning circulation is really more of an invective diffusive spread of these water masses throughout the entire North Atlantic. We really see no hint of these polar um, interior flows. So what I want to do now is move to the second part of my talk, which is on the AMOC variability and its linkage with deep water mass formation. I think most of you know here that the sixth assessment report for the IPCC is due out um, this summer, uh, July of 2021. What I'm showing here then is the results from the 2014. And I'm showing this because um, I prefaced my talk by talking about that 2002 NRC report that was titled Abrupt Climate Change. And um, because at that time, now 19, years ago, there was a real concern that the AMOC could switch off abruptly and cause, I want to say cataclysmic um, climate uh, changes. I think people probably saw that movie um, the day after um, tomorrow, which was talked more about things on Hollywood timescale necessarily than geologic timescales. Uh, but in the intervening uh, years following that 2002 report, um, there has been a general consensus that um, it's very likely that the AMOC will weaken over the 21st century with best estimates for the reduction of 11 to 34 percent, but it is unlikely that it will um, abruptly um, stop or abru abruptly change. So the, we are no longer so concerned about very, very rapid changes. However, we are really concerned about um, how, how much it will weaken and when. 
um, in that report, um, AMOC changes are attributed to the reduction of deep water formation in the North Atlantic. And I'm showing the plots at the top because I want to give you an idea. Then and even now, um, the wide range in AMOC um, estimates that are given by these um, by these climate models. You can see the means are quite different in measuring the AMOC at 30 degrees north, and their variability in the centuries ahead is also quite different. Which is why um, I I think many of us, especially who work in the observational realm. Um, understand that we need to have um, observations in order to ground tooth the models. Now, the climate models have shown consistently that changes in conductive activity in the Labrador and the Nordic Seas lead to changes in the Murmiana overturning circulation. And a question I've asked for why on has motivated the OSNAP array is what is the observational basis uh, for this link? Shortly after that 2002 report, um, the UK led an effort and the US uh, collaborated with that effort as well. In fact, uh, NOAA and NSF have joined in that funding of the rapid array. And this rapid array was first deployed in 2004. And it is the first um, array that has directly observed the overturning circulation. And I can't emphasize enough how when the first results came out from this uh, rapid array, how um, startling they were for oceanographers to understand the variability of the overturning circulation on so um, many timescales. We had expected it to be fairly slowly varying and that first paper, Cunningham et al. in 2006, I believe, was really um, quite, quite startling. This uh, rapid program um, is in place today at 30 degrees north, as I said, between the UK um, and the US, and I just want to tell you, um, give you a little bit of an update on the results there. I mentioned earlier that way back when, uh, when I was starting my career, um, the expectation was that the overturning circulation uh, was really forced by uh, the density driven circulation or the thermal hanging circulation. The rapid array, though, um, studies have shown that. Um, a large part of that variability can be explained by wind forcing. This Zhao and John's paper from 2014 is one of my favorites. Um, and what uh, they did was, you see there in red, uh, the AMOC at 26 degrees north is taken as the sum of the Gulf Stream transport, the wind-driven Ekman transport in black, and then the mid-ocean transport in pink. And so, the uh, dashed are what has been observed um, over the years. Um, obviously, the mid-ocean um, transport um, estimate has only been able to be um, available since the um, rapid array has been uh, put in place. But the Gulf Stream transport has been measured for, uh, for many years. And of course, with altimetry in the winds, we can get an estimate of the Ekman. The main thing I want to show here, though, is that, oops, Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. Using um, a two layer model driven by local winds, um, Zhao and Johns were able to simulate the um, AMOC time series at 26 degrees north. And other than sort of overestimating this dip from 2009 to 2010, they were able to show a very strong linkage, or they were able to show that they could almost match um, the observed variability. In fact, the correlation between the simulated AMOC, again, a two-layer model driven only by winds and the AMOC observed was found to be 0.82. So moving ahead to one of the more recent papers on RAPID by Ben Moat and colleagues that came out in 2020. Uh, this is now 16 years down the road um, for RAPID. The top um, time series there is the um, AMOC observed uh, since the start, and then the bottom three time series show the seasonal cycle, interannual variability, and then the AMOC residual after the seasonal cycle and interannual variability has been taken out. The main message here, um, I think those of you who have followed this, um, the rapid um, studies from the um, from the rapid array have understood that there has been some discussion in the community among the rapid um, investigators as to whether or not 
the rapid time series was uh, showing any decay, uh, decline, excuse me. Um, in this, the most recent results that they've added to the time series, you, the title sort of says it all. There is a pending recovery in the strength of the meridian overturning circulation. Um, in the abstract, the AMOC is no longer weakening, um, although they note that the long term mean or the recent transport is still not above the long term mean. But what I did, I wanted to point out um, as a prelude to my uh, introduction about the OSNAP array is that. Um, they, these 16 years, they say it's still um, difficult to understand whether there is or is not a long term trend. And at 26 North, it's difficult to understand how responsive the overturning circulation here is at 30 degrees north to the intense buoyancy forcing in the subpolar North Atlantic. Now, one of the things I told you earlier was that years ago, um, we thought of the meridian overturning circulation as something. Um, very coherent. If you measured it at one place, you would expect to see that same variability as another as another place because we had the current the conveyor belt paradigm in mind. Um, starting though in 2007, and in fact, this is one of the papers that really uh, motivated the OSNAP array. Studies started coming out showing that the meridional coherence of the AMOC variability um, was not something we could rely on. So. On the left is from um, ocean uh, circulation model showing the mean AMOC streamlines. Um, so we're looking at depth and latitude, and then we see that um, overturning circulation is expected. And then when we look at the Hobmuller diagram on the right, and we're looking at the AMOC anomalies, so these are transport anomalies in spare drops, and we're looking at the Hobmuller and climb on the on the um, x-axis, and then with latitude. What uh, this study pointed out is that there's a, a break in the coherence of the AMOC anomalies at about the subtropical subpolar um, latitudes. And so what was assumed then was that the high frequency um, signature of the AMOC in the subpolar subtropical North Atlantic was likely uh, more wind driven and we could perhaps see the um, buoyancy driven a variability of the AMOC signal at higher latitudes in the subpolar North Atlantic. And so starting um, in 2009, uh, colleagues and I started designing a monitoring system for the subpolar North Atlantic because the idea was, well, in the subpolar North Atlantic is where we know we have um, subpolar so mold water farmed, Labrador sea water farmed, and we know that the overflow waters come through uh, the subpolar North Atlantic. So the idea was to move to the subpolar North Atlantic, um, not just monitor the overturning circulation, but really try to understand the linkage between the overturning circulation and the water mass uh, formation. So this uh, transoceanic line uh, was designed in two parts. Uh, one part um, from um, the Labrador coast over to the east coast, uh, southeast tip of Greenland. Then we picked it up on the other side, south. Whoops, that is southwest. And then we picked it up on the southeast side and went all the way over um, to the Scottish shelf. You see schematically um, the current meter arrays that we have in place. The float program that I talked about earlier was also part of this OSNAP program. We've also uh, used gliders in those regions um, where, because of fishing activity, it has been difficult to maintain fixed uh, moorings. This array was deployed in the summer um, of 2000 and was the result um, of many uh, companies, uh, companies, many countries, Canada, the Netherlands, US, the US, um, uh, Germany, uh, the UK, uh, France, and then later uh, China came in as a partner um, with, the, with the glider program partnering with um, the US. This gives you just a fuller um, idea of the um, array itself. This shows you the salinity across the OSNAP west and east. So the Labrador Sea all the way over the Rockland Trough. Here are the very, this is the salinity, the very salty waters of the North Atlantic current that comprise the upper limb of the overturning circulation. 
And here we see these deep waters that are formed in each of these basins, very fresh waters. This is the Labrador seawater that's formed. This is from the mean from 2014 to 2016. And this winter, the first winter in particular that we had our OSNAP array was a winter where there was tremendous buoyancy loss in the subpolar North Atlantic. So we considered ourselves extremely fortunate to uh, be able to see such a strong signal. Here's the results uh, from our four years to date. Um, the OSNAP array remains in the water. Um, and what we're looking at here is the time series over those four years. We're looking at the maximum of the overturning stream function in density space. If, for, if you first look at the black line, this is the AMOC in sphere drops of the whole array, OSNAP East and OSNAP West combined. And the most remarkable thing to us that was pointed out at the time is that the OSNAP East overturning, that is from Greenland over to the Scottish Shelf, can really explain almost all of the overturning in the subpolar um, North Atlantic, captures almost all of it. Prior decades, we, the, it, we considered the Labrador seawater to be a very strong contributor, but over our four year time series, the Labrador seawater Labrador Sea contributed very little um, to, the, to the overturning. So I'm just going to touch on why we got, perhaps got this unexpected uh, result. We're looking now across the Labrador Basin. So this is OSNAP West. And in the upper left, we're looking at a cross section of the temperature in the upper right, salinity, and in the lower left, potential vorticity. And what you see in this um, at depth, these uh, waters here are really this large volume and temperature space of the Labrador seawater that is uh, uh, formed, relatively cold waters compared to the surface. Here it is in salinity space, large volume of the Labrador seawater. An indicator of newly formed waters, though, are potential vorticity, and you see a smaller volume of that potential vorticity. And this started giving us some hint about what was what was going on. And what I want to say to you is when we think about the overturning, we're almost always thinking in terms of density space, light waters transformed into dense waters. But we also have warm waters transformed into cold waters, and we have salty waters transformed into fresh waters. And so we can think of overturning not just in density space, but we can measure it in temperature space and we can measure it in salinity space. When we go in the Labrador Sea and use our OSNAP observations and measure the overturning in the temperature space, we find 13.9 spheredrops in salinity space, 11.4 spheredrops. But in density space, it's more like two or three spheredrops. And so it matters quite a bit. Um, and what we're finding is that there's very strong density compensation in that Labrador Sea. And so the overturning in years past, if people were just considering temperature or salinity, would have estimates for that overturning that's far different than thinking about in density space. The other thing I want to mention is why do we, um, that why is OSNAP East, where is all that water coming from? How is it produced on the, across that section from OSNAP East? And why is it so strongly uh, variable? A nice study, Bring It On All in 2019, um, shows the time series of these overflow waters coming into the North Atlantic. The European Consortium has really uh, maintained a nice set of measurements for now um, two, three decades um, across those sills. And what you see here is that the variability of these overflows it's quite small compared to the variability we see at OSNAP. I should have told you, pointed out that that variability across OSNAP is on the order of almost as large as 15 or, or 16 uh, spare drops. And so our understanding when we look at what's coming across from the um, overflow is pretty steady. We also know that it's about six spare drops. And so what that means is that the remainder of that seven or so spare drops was really produced on within the subpolar North Atlantic north of the OSNAP line. And so that the um, time series that you're seeing here in black is that highly variable OSNAP East time series. In purple here is the 
um, Greenland Scotland Ridge contribution. So you see that it adds about six stair drips that can hardly explain the total and the variability. And that means that the difference between the two sections is how much deep water we, is needed to be produced between the OSNAP section and the Greenland Scotland Ridge. And on the lower left is a paper that just came out last year that Tilly's Petit, a postdoc working with me, put together. And what you'll see here, if we, if we focus on this blue number here, 6.6 spare drops is the amount of water, if we look at the volume budget, based on the amount that's coming in uh, from the Nordic Seas to this area and how much we know is coming out. This is how much water that has to come from the upper layer to the lower layer. The red, based on our volume uh, estimates, is how much water has to go from the upper to the lower. I think I said that right. And then the black is a completely independent estimate that tells us based on the air sea heat fluxes and the ocean surface density field, how much water is transformed. And so in this study, what Tillis was able to show is that the waters in the sub these deep waters in the um, meridional overturning circulation are really a combination of the overflow waters that are coming over the sills, plus these waters that are formed in the OSNAP East from Greenland to Scotland. And the Labrador seawater is producing very little um, of the uh, volume of the overflow waters. Okay, I'm hoping I'm doing okay on time and I think I'm doing fine. Um, in summary, from the first part, uh, what I wanna leave you with is this idea that we do not have this conveyor belt where these deep waters are flowing along the deep western boundary currents. Instead, as I, as I mentioned, we see this strongly effective diffusive spread um, of these overflow waters equatorward throughout the North Atlantic, particularly for the Iceland Scotland overflow water, where a lot of that water is flowing um, on to the east of the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Our OSNAP time series shows the dominance of the overturning from Greenland to Scotland. Um, density compensation in the Labrador Sea is very strong and may be why prior estimates of that contribution to the overturning um, owed a much larger contribution. And then also we can explain that uh, transformation, the Iceland and Erminger basins based on the air sea heat fluxes. So what are some of the new questions about um, the AMOC? Um, there are lots of new questions about the AMOC from these new observations. That's one of the great things about observations. You do answer some things, but other questions uh, come along. But I do want to say with the combination of the rapid array, um, the OSNAP array, the SAMOC array in the South Atlantic and other, the Argo floats, what we're, you know, the data we have available from the satellites, we're really making great strides. The questions remain. So is the OSNAP four-year time series um, representative? So what we're looking at here is a GLOW C5 reanalysis. And this is going back to the altimetry um, era. We see in blue and uh, red are the estimates of the OSNAP West in using this reanalysis data in the Labrador Sea in density space and salinity space. And in black is in density space. And so this is very much what we've seen with our four year time series of OSNAP, that we have strong contributions in temperature and salinity, meaning that we're producing this uh, cold uh, water, but it has uh, there's strong density compensation going on, such that there's very little compensation in density space. Why are climate models so responsive to LSW changes? What we're showing here from a paper that also came out last year by a research scientist working with me, we're looking here at the observations. This is averaged over four years. We're looking at potential vorticity, which is an indication of the volume of the deep water that's formed in the Labrador Sea. And if we compare the blue here to the blue, the large volume that's formed in each of these models, we see a striking contrast between the amount of deep water. So in that paper, we can see the time series here of the volume of the deep water that's formed each winter in these different models formed in over this uh, box here on the left-hand side compared to the observation. 
So if that amount of deep water is formed, we are probably not surprised then to see that the meridional overturning circulation across that OSNAP West is very large compared to, here's the OSNAP um, estimate. Here's an estimate that was uh, produced from Argo floats. Here's an estimate that was reduced from a series, produced from a series of hydrographic sections taken by the Carton Spall back in the early part um, of this century. So moving forward, we're very hopeful that our OSNAP estimates and the rapid estimates can really give some ground truthing to these models because we understand this is an intensive observational um, effort, um, also expensive. And what we're wanting to do is to have it in the water for a sufficient uh, period of time such that we can ground truth these models and understand also design a more efficient system for measuring the overturning circulation. So I'm going to finish um, with the two questions I have here um, in yellow. And I'm going to finish them by first giving you a quote. Um, way back when I was in college, um, I used to read more about philosophy than I have time for now. But one of my favorite philosophers was a Roman philosopher named Pliny the Elder. He lived in the first century um, AD. He's the one that was sort of done in by the um, Vesuvius, the eruption of Vesuvius. But he was always um, trying to um, avoid the question of, um, is there a God? And uh, finally, one day when he was being questioned about whether or not there was a God, he said, the question is difficult and life is short. And I'm mentioning that now because these last two questions are difficult and this seminar is short. I could give you a seminar um, each on these questions. What is the relationship with the AMOC to the North Atlantic SSTs? That depends on who you who you ask to ask, but here's my take. I do not believe that the SST trends are just a signature of AMOC variability. Um, we understand that the SST can vary in the subpolar North Atlantic in particular because of AMOC changes, because of changes to the subpolar gyre, because of changes to the wind patterns, uh, because of changes in storminess. So piecing out what part of that SST um, is due to the impact of the AMOC is really important, but it's not, it's not at all easy. And why we're interested in that is because the SST impact on continental precipitation, hurricanes, et cetera, has really been demonstrated over and over again. So one of the burning questions that is still out there is, um, to what extent does AMOC variability impact the SST variability? The other question that we're really interested in pursuing moving forward is the sensitivity of the AMOC to the expected increase in land and sea ice melt. And so when I um, first uh, had a, a workshop at Duke in 2009, gathered uh, colleagues from um, Europe and Canada and the US to then at Duke University, we really were always focused on the overturning circulation itself. I will say that OSNAP now is really focused, of course, on the overturning, but also on the meridional transport of heat and the meridional transport of fresh water. I think of OSNAP now as the gateway for heat to the Arctic, a big question about what is the impact of that heat, those warm North Atlantic waters on um, the sea ice as well as the glacial ice, you know, in the um, Nordic and Arctic seas. And then also uh, the other way, when that fresh water comes back, what is the impact of that fresh water as it moves into um, the subpolar North Atlantic and further south? What is the feedback on that to the overturning circulation? So we have um, a partnering, you know, with a number of people modeling and other observationals to really try to understand, I think, these two overarching questions to which OSNAP uh, can help. So I hope I have left enough time uh, for questions. I sort of feel like I did a mad dash through that, but I hope that has given set some historical context for why um, we proposed OSNAP and gave you an idea of what we're finding with some of our first results. So with that, Ellen or John, I will hand it back to you. Thank you, Professor Lozier. Oh, Ellen would like to speak first. <laughs> sure. 
Thank you so much, Professor Lozier. We really appreciated your mm -hmm. seminar. And Cassie will take charge now and mm -hmm. hold the floor for questions. And I apologize. I'm going to have to go off in a few meetings for minutes for another talk. But no I really worries, enjoyed Anne. your presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. I like my taking charge. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, if anyone has any questions for Professor Lozier, um, you can raise your hand. You can do that by expanding the participants panel. There's a hand icon, or you can type your question and I will unmute you. I see Mike Evans has typed a question in the chat. Oh, it is quite long. Um, here's the first one. So is the rapid approach and calculations consistent with what you found from the float programs? Advective diffusive control, lots of recirculation explained by density co compensation. So the density compensation is really sort of a, uh, a subpolar North Atlantic, actually just the Labrador Sea piece of that. Um, but I will say, uh, will you read the first part? Is what they're seeing at rapid? Oh, sure. I can I can read it, but also Mike, maybe you want. Yeah, Mike. Um, why don't you come? Could on? I, yeah. Yeah. Could we? Could I? I, I don't want to unmute him without permission. Um, but if it gives me an indication. <laughs> Maybe what I'll do, I'll just talk while he's, or if, unless he's on now. Oh, here, I can unmute him. He says it's, he says I can. Okay, Mike, you're uh, unmuted. Hi, I'm sorry. Um, I was just oh. typing notes um, to myself and just did not expect, Susan, that you would answer all these questions. Oh, and I don't want to oh. take all the time anyway. Um, my, my main question is, could you come back and give us another couple of seminars? Um, but uh, let, let me ask, uh, let me ask one that's actually not written there that I thought of uh, in your third part, which is, I was just curious your, your thoughts about um, um, the, 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 our ability to, um, to reconstruct um, things that are related to AMOC, say over the past um, century, 10 centuries, 20 centuries, and, um, you know, there's that relatively recent paper by Caesar. I wonder if you've read it and could comment on it from a physical oceanographer point of view. Thanks. Yes, and I was alluding to this a little bit um, because when I said that SST, relying on SST, oh, here, okay, let me go back. Um, oceanographers, we mostly from the beginning have had property distributions, right? Um, and we have been inferring circulation changes from property distributions. And in large part, um, in large part in the paleo world, not completely, we are, you know, we, not we, um, there is a reliance on those proxies on those properties, abyssal temperatures, certain uh, surface temperatures. I do know people have made efforts to reconstruct density gradients, or they've made efforts to try to understand um, boundary turn strength by grain size. But I'll say in general, um, and I'm, I'm gonna stick with like the past hundred or so years. Um, I think for a given temperature change, um, I think you can construct a number of mechanisms that can create that temperature change. So I, and a number of studies have come out that have, that have talked about this. So what in the very long time scales and the paleo time scales, I absolutely do think that a number of those mechanisms that where we can think about may no longer be valid. And it may be that the AMOC on thousands of years is really the only mechanism that could create those temperature changes of that size. In the modern world, on the timescales we're talking about now with years and decades, um, I don't think that's the case. I think that um, it's more important for us to understand it's the dynamics and, and look at the dynamics that's producing that. That is a very long way, Mike, that um, I don't have any confidence that we have um, any data right now that shows us the AMOC has been in decline. I will say, though, I have confidence that moving ahead with the continued warming and the continued freshening, I have an expectation that it will decline. But I think if you look at that rapid array, um, very difficult. You look at the subpolar north line that has been cooling recently, it's very difficult to say with any certainty that we have any change in that, in that um, overturning circulation. 
I probably used all my time answering questions just with that one. I'll be a little more efficient with the next one. <laughs> Thank you. And also, I can I can just go ahead and second um, Mike's comment that you're welcome to come back and, and give us another talk. <laughs> um, David Trossman also has a question, um, but it is also very long. Um, so I wonder, David, uh, could I unmute you just so you can uh, have more of a conversation with Professor Lozier? Hi, David. <laughs> I don't know if you remember what we met before, David. David, I'm not. I'm not unmute you just in case. I don't know if uh, I can. I can meet you again. Yeah, of course I remember you, Susan. Um, mm -hmm. So my question has to do with some recent papers that have come out. Um, one by Caesar et al., um, who I, they didn't really address the cause of the overturning circulation change and weakening over the past millennium, but they suggest from paleo proxies that uh, it's the weakest it's been in uh, a millennium. And then there's another study, Levang and Schmidt, that came out using CIMET-5 models talking about future weakening. And they suggest due to outcropping um, uh, radional transport con contours in the subtropical North Atlantic, um, they argue that the warming in the North Atlantic is going to cause the weakening of the AMOC. And so I'm, I'm wondering, how do you make sense of these two findings? Most people think of the AMOC changes over the past millennium due to uh, ice melt uh, from land and changing uh, deep convection, et cetera, formation of deep water masses. And in the wrong regions, people usually uh, talk about that uh, as you just talked about in this uh, nice seminar, but um, people still believe that it, people still do those freshwater forcing experiments. Sorry, long question. Yeah, and actually, thank you. Um, I'm going to pick up where where you ended on the on the freshwater, and this is why I talked about uh, the OSNAP as a gateway, you know, from the Arctic with the freshwater. And one of the things that I didn't mention that. Um, the implications of our first OSNAP finding uh, has is that we obviously are very concerned or very interested in what the surface properties are in these areas where we have this strong convection. And there has been a strong focus on the properties in the Labrador Sea. Um, but what we have found, you know, with these new OSNAP results is uh, we should also be very concerned about the properties, the surface properties in the Erminger um, and the Iceland basins. And probably, you know, David, as well, that those early flooding experiments, first of all, tremendous amount of fresh water, right? Unrealistic yeah. uh, for the world we live in now, right? Um, and also, they just flooded the, um, the North Atlantic uniformly. And people now um, have, um, one, um, they have uh, models, you know, where they're looking at the discharge you know, from from the fjords into the shelf areas, and they are finding like, um, it's just reading one paper where um, when that fresh water is released from the Western Greenland, it's um, because of the wind forcing, it's really constrained um, to the coastal waters or the shelf and doesn't come into the interior of the Labrador Sea. Whereas the water, um, those uh, glacial melt waters that again in from the Eastern side of the Greenland, um, have more of a chance coming around that boundary current to get into the interior of the Labrador Sea. So this is what I was saying earlier that um, even our, when I was saying we had this understanding of this large scale conveyor belt, that things moved down the western boundary current, it was continuous, and now we look at this complexity, there's really also this sophisticated complexity with how these fresh waters move into um, move into the uh, into the subpolar North Atlantic is exactly where the convective regions are. So, I mean, I think freshwater and um, the, the warm waters are both, you know, going to contribute, but I can't tell you which is, which is going to win out. Um, I think we need to understand really that um, the fresh waters, are they getting, you know, in, uh, to these areas where we have these uh, deep waters, you know, that are that are being formed. The other thing I'll say is that these deep waters are being formed right now because of where we, um, of the, the surface density fields and the buoyancy forcing 
and 100 years from now, maybe we'll be back to the Labrador where the deep water, you know, is being formed. So I, my hope, and I, I think I've said this now three times, but that's after having lectured for so many years, I feel like I need to say things three years, three times. Um, oh gosh, now I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh, I, my hope is that what the OSNAP array is able to do is to provide some ground truthing um, for these, a lot of these processes so that we can, one, really have climate models that produce more realistic um, volumes of deep waters. I think that's number one thing, because if you overproduce, and especially in the wrong places, but if you overproduce, you're going to have to send that water uh, downstream because the the subpolar North Atlantic can't restratify those really really large volumes, you know, of water. So I think order one is getting the volume of deep water, you know, correct, and then also getting these freshwater pathways correct as well. Thank you. Thank you. Nice, nice to nice to hear your voice again, David. Thank you. I was also chatted this question earlier. Um, how does the density anomalies in the deep western boundary current affect subpolar meridional meridional <laughs> overturning circulation variability? Yes. So the density anomalies, that's that's the key, right? So if we believe geostrophy, um, what we really need to know is the difference between the density anomalies at the western boundary and the density anomalies um, at the eastern boundary. But the question is. What's forming the density anomalies? Right? So those density anomalies can be produced because the isopycnals are moving up and down, because you have Rossby waves, you have wind forcing, they can be produced because you've invected anomaly, you know, downstream. So we absolutely understand that's why we're measuring at the boundaries, right? Rapid measures east and west. Um, OSNEP has many more arrays because of the complexity of the subpolar North Atlantic in its basin. But yes, it's density anomalies, but we're trying to understand what is it that's um, that's forcing those. In fact, this one that I've, oh, I kept this up for a reason, but you'll see that the AMOC seasonal cycle, interannual variability, all of those, you know, we can get from measuring the western and eastern boundaries, but it's just variability on different time scales. I wanted to go back to the question about the Caesar et al. study. So in their paper, they say that the rapid results, um, the rapid results, what's the word, are aligned with their decline, right? And I just uh, wanna point out this AMOC time series at the top and what that rapid you know, investigators also say about the um, overturning circulation at 26 degrees north. It's really um, impossible, or I think that's what they say. It's not yet possible to determine um, a long-term trend here. But I hope I answered that question about the density anomalies. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? That's it for my queue, but if we might have time for one last minute question if somebody's got something that can't they can't keep in. Mike, uh, Mike Evans says that was great in the chat. Just so, just so you know, he's. Oh, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Okay, well, it looks like we are done with our Q and A. Um, thank you so much, Professor Lozier, for giving us this sure. great talk. It seems like everybody really loved it. Um, and thank you, everybody else, for attending. Um, and just please tune in next week as our seminar series continues. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank Bye. you, Professor. We will send you the video recording once we get it. All Thank right. you so Thank much. Thank you, John. Again, you were a great host. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.